Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And today we're going to talk once again about Epic and Apple and Google and everything that's going on there, but from a slightly different direction. On your screen right now, you see the logo for Unity, the Unity engine, the main competitor on mobile, at least, to Epic's Unreal engine. And as we've seen discussed as part of this whole antitrust epic, epic versus everyone, whatever the playlist might be called today or tomorrow, is that there are all of these giant tech companies, including Microsoft, including Sony, including Nintendo, that might be affected by an epic win against Apple, that Epic's theory of the case suggests these major massive ramifications against things like the entire walled garden model. But what we have also seen as part of this discussion is that even before you get to the end state of this litigation, that Epic wins years from now or Apple wins years from now, that there are little changes that are being made by these tech companies, whether they're in software or in engine sales, as we see with Unity, based on some of the arguments that are presented, based on where they see the wind blowing. We saw as part of this Epic announce with a bunch of other parties, the Coalition for App Fairness. We saw them adopt these 10 baseline rules that they want to use to justify their arguments against Apple, that Apple is a monopoly and they're keeping them down, that they want app stores to be free on whatever operating system they exist on, on mobile, that they don't want to pay the 30%, that they don't want to have to use IAP payment processing, all these various things. We saw Microsoft respond to the whole litigation first by putting together a statement on Epic's behalf saying, hey, it would be a very bad thing if Apple were allowed to cut off Epic International, cut off the Unreal Engine from the store. We then saw Microsoft really kind of double down on that by backing up Epic by adopting these App Store principles as articulated by the Coalition for App Fairness, not on the Xbox, where they would seem most applicable, but on Windows in general. And certainly from a public marketing standpoint, this does represent a backing of Epic, a backing of the forces that seek to break up some of the Apple power over the iOS ecosystem. And Microsoft has thrown in its lot in that direction. Now, both the Coalition for App Fairness and Microsoft moved in this direction with the acknowledgement that the subcommittee of the U.S. Congress, subcommittee of the judiciary, was moving forward with a report that would find that Apple is acting as a monopoly. Again, as we talked about in our video on this report, that isn't definitive. That doesn't mean that a judge somewhere has to listen to the congressional subcommittee on this topic. But it does mean that as all of this is happening at once, these tech giants and these various companies are moving forward with responses to what they are seeing in front of them. I know a number of people have come up in my comments and said, hey, is Microsoft doing this? Is anybody else going to react to this thing over here? And we've seen all of this as part of only a couple of months of action on these topics. We also saw Amazon and Facebook and Microsoft fighting against Apple in various respects of how their apps work through the App Store. We've seen Microsoft and Amazon make at least certain minimum gains against Apple on Apple's own terms and conditions by allowing these kinds of companies, Microsoft and Amazon, to use browser-based apps to get their game streaming services on the iOS. That Apple which admittedly had language in their rules that allowed Safari applications to function on their system, now had put more express language that said, hey, just so we're clear, you can do these kinds of things. You can use a browser to get these kinds of effects on our iOS ecosystem. Now, as some have pointed out, Apple's guidelines, Apple's rules are subject to Apple's changes, Apple's whims at any point in time. And if this makes too much money, Apple could lower the hammer down on either Microsoft or Amazon, but right now in an environment where Congress is investigating them, where various other regulators across the world are investigating them, Apple probably, probably isn't going to make these significant negative moves against these various other parties in big technology because to do so invites more of this and really starts to solidify consumer goodwill as well as regulator goodwill against them. Now, with that as the backdrop, we've seen these kinds of changes happening as part of this discussion really in the last 60 days. We go back to some of the documents that were filed in Epic versus Apple, right? We see that when Epic and Apple were fighting over the preliminary injunction that we just saw issued this past weekend, that Apple tried to bring up that Unreal Engine isn't that big of a deal on the Apple iOS, 
says, Epic also offers Unreal Engine. They're explaining to the court what that is. A graphics engine available on many platforms, including PlayStation, Xbox, Nintendo, Switch, PC, Mac, and the iPhone that provides a suite of tools that developers can license to generate graphics for apps across a number of platforms, just one of which is the iPhone. Unreal Engine is one graphics engine that developers can use. By comparison, one of Unreal Engine's key competitors, Unity, characterizes itself as the world's leading platform for creating and operating interactive real-time 3D content and is available for more than 20 platforms, including Windows, Mac, iOS, Android, PlayStation, Xbox, Nintendo Switch, and the leading augmented and virtual reality platforms, among others. Apple's tooting Unity's horn in this discussion, right? Because Apple is seeking to allow themselves or to have the court not prohibit them from terminating Epic's access to the iOS ecosystem, not just for Fortnite and Epic Games' division, but also for Epic International and their support of their Unreal Engine. So they're trying to tell the court, hey, Unreal Engine isn't that important. In red here, we see Unity is used by the overwhelming majority of Apple developers that use a graphics engine. This was Apple's opposition to Epic's request for the preliminary injunction is filed in September. Epic then responded by saying, hey, ho, Apple's claim that its retaliation against Unreal Engine would not harm developers because of the availability of Unity, an Unreal Engine competitor, is false. Unreal Engine developers have put time and resources into projects reliant on Unreal Engine, and moving away would cause them significant harm. And the removal from the market of one out of two primary engines currently available to developers would likewise harm developers for years to come. That the competition amongst engine licensing on the Apple ecosystem would be reduced, would be hurt. One of the other things you saw in these documents, and I'm not going to summarize them all, God knows I have enough hours of content on this channel, in this playlist, talking about these various documents, is that Epic says, well, you know what? One of the things that you have to grant us this preliminary injunction on, one of the reasons for making sure that Apple keeps Unreal on their store, that they can't take these actions against us, is that Unreal developers will start to feel bad about us. They won't choose Unreal, not just on the Apple iOS, but also on the Xbox and the PlayStation and anywhere else that we might appear. In fact, the Microsoft statement on behalf of Epic at the earlier levels of the temporary restraining order levels in August suggested exactly that fact, that Microsoft's own in-house developers would have to really look twice at using Unreal Engine if the court didn't grant this preliminary injunction prohibiting Apple from kicking Unreal Engine out of the App Store. Now, one of the things I said in my videos in a number of places is that that horse has already left the barn, right? These developers who are making these choices today that are potentially early on in their development yesterday are right now evaluating Unreal Engine anew, right? Or at least they should be because whether or not a judge does something is out of your control, but whether or not Tim Sweeney and your engine partner does something is not as outside your control, or at least the contractual relationship that you chose is within your control. And if somebody like Tim Sweeney in Epic Games is doing these various things, is making these various noises, having these litigations, which are in no respect a surefire winner and putting your livelihood at risk, then you're evaluating that. Maybe you continue with Unreal Engine for this project. Maybe you're too far along. Maybe it's still a better deal. Maybe you like the cost of the Unreal Engine license, et cetera, et cetera. But you are most certainly, as part of this whole process, evaluating that Unity is used by the overwhelming majority of Apple developers, right? That Unity is out there and a possibility. And if you're Unity, if you're Unity Marketing, if you're Unity CEO, if you're Unity's general counsel, you want to take advantage of that fact that right now we have an inflection point, that people that have been working with Unreal Engine are at bare minimum a little bit more cautious about that relationship, looking at it and saying, well, we're not sure what Epic is going to do on any given day. We like this engine. Maybe we keep it. But on the margins where we were 90% comfortable before all this started, maybe we're 70% comfortable right now. And on that margin, maybe Unity can sweep in and say, hey, Maybe we can do something nice for you. Maybe we can add a little bit more benefits to using the Unity engine. And you see Unity do that today, this morning. Where, as you can see on your screen, they introduced the Game Growth Program. Game Growth Program is an accelerator program for free-to-play indie games on mobile. By partnering with Unity, select indie developers get access to awesome tools, plus a dedicated team of game operations experts 
Unity covers the costs of acquiring new players and optimizing your game, and we share the revenue 50-50. Now, we're going to talk about this program in a second. I'm going to talk to you about it like a lawyer. Uh, I'm going to tell you why I would recommend that you have counsel if you're going to enter into something like this in any respect with Unity or anybody else, that you have that agreement reviewed by counsel because there are ways to trip you up on these kinds of things. This is the kind of thing that I do for a living. Don't have to hire Hoag Law, but you probably should talk to somebody that reads these contracts on the regular. But before we talk about that program, there's a couple things to note, right? This is Unity adding a benefit to using the Unity engine. Maybe you apply for this. Maybe you qualify. Maybe you don't. We will see. It's essentially an early access. They're testing if they really want to do this. But not only are they going to try to add this benefit, they're doing it right now, October 13th, within a week of the preliminary injunction order coming down that, yes, allowed Unreal Engine to stay on the App Store, but at the discretion of a single person that easily could have gone the other direction. If you read the actual order that came out that issued from the court, on that preliminary injunction, you saw that Apple was inches away from convincing the court that Epic had caused this own irreparable harm to Unreal Engine and that Apple had the right to terminate its contracts for convenience. And the court really came out on that question very closely. And if Epic had lost that argument, well, then Unreal Engine would have been kicked off through no fault of the developers, which is what convinced the court to not do it ultimately, is that all of these people would be affected that didn't do anything, that didn't send Tim Sweeney's emails or tweets, and that they shouldn't be harmed just by Epic acting, uh, let's say, a little impetuously. And even though that is in fact the case, you still have a Unity option if you are an Unreal developer, and this is the time to evaluate those things. Now, I would also say October 13th, 2020, this doesn't mean that this program wasn't already in process, right? They didn't come up with this from Friday, from late Friday of last week to Tuesday of this week. But as anybody that's worked in business knows that anybody looks at launches and rollouts and things that you're going to announce, you can shift those things around. And it wouldn't surprise me at all if Unity looked at this and said, now is a good time, right in the shadow of Epic creating at bare minimum this uncertainty with its various developer partners to say, hey, not only are we going to be more certain, you're going to be able to trust Unity, we're not trying to make any waves on these kinds of points, but if you make your game in Unity, maybe you qualify for this thing. And if you're a real small party, as we will see, this might be something that is valuable to you. We'll continue with their blog post. Again, remember, this is a marketing blog post. This is Unity's language, uh, so they're going to try to sell this as hard as possible. Let's face it. Small teams with big dreams are in fierce competition to find the right audience. How do you acquire players and keep them engaged? This is where the game growth program comes in. We partner with select indie game developers to help you quickly and effectively scale your game while you remain 100% independent. When you become a partner, you gain access to industry-leading tools and experts in player acquisition, engagement, monetization, and more, all while retaining full ownership of your studio and your intellectual property. Now, what's funny, right, is from the consumer standpoint, we've talked a lot in virtual legality about loot boxes and monetization and all these things that people don't necessarily like and that mobile games are maybe at the forefront of behaviors and activities that people don't like. But from the developer side of things, you've built a good game. You don't have economists on your staff. You don't know how to monetize this thing. There are two different skill sets, right? Between making this awesome game, setting those rules, programming it, getting the graphics in, and then selling the thing. Making enough money for you to feed your family and to make the next game. And that's where a lot of people get tripped up. And there's where a lot of people get tripped up in startup industry outside of software, right? I have a big book of business that's in technology, sure, or in other industrial fields, but that has a startup, has a great idea, maybe has an idea to make a prototype, but doesn't have the CEO background, doesn't have the business background to take the concept and what we would call commercialize it. Get it out into the market. Get it out into the market and manufactured in a way that makes you money, that keeps your company lights on. And so this kind of relationship can be enormously effective if you don't have that kind of business acumen, but you are a game development genius. And you shouldn't feel bad about the fact that you don't have both hats. Very few people do. And in fact, the people that do tend to not be geniuses at one or the other. They're very good at both, but maybe not accelerating on either side of the spectrum. And so these kinds of relationships can be good, but there's a lot of things that you have to watch out for. The game growth program is open to already published free-to-play indie mobile games. So you've already put it up on the store. It can basically prove itself because one of the things that Unity is going to do 
as part of your already released game is they're going to evaluate the analytics related to it to see whether what they are going to offer here makes sense. If you meet the criteria and we accept you into the program, which they reference to checking out our facts for specific requirements. This is brand new this morning. So I looked in the facts uh, pages. I didn't see anything. There isn't a link here. So what the requirements here is probably a little bit unclear, but suffice it to say, they're going to evaluate whether they can make money with you, right? Unity wants to make money. You want to make money, but Unity doesn't just want to throw money in the trash, which we will also talk about. If you meet the criteria, Unity will fund user acquisition for your game and provide the technology and Unity experts to help manage player engagement and monetization. We take care of the process that helps grow your game while you concentrate on development. We're going to take your business back office side of things for you while you make a game. Game growth is a revenue sharing program. Unity and the developer team split the revenue from advertising and in-app purchases 50-50 after the user acquisition spend has been recouped. We want to be clear about the terms up front so you can decide if game growth is the right program for you. Let's break it down in an example. We're going to talk about this. An indie developer has a mobile game that makes $3,000 a month. Good job, indie developer. They apply to the game growth program. Unity then spends $100,000 a month to acquire new users to the game, retains those users with dedicated live operations support, and grows the game to $130,000 per month in revenue. Now, if those numbers seem ridiculous, they are not. A lot of the app store kind of functionality, the mobile app development, that whole market is effectively sales. It's marketing. And this isn't that unusual even for AAA games or console games. But when you think about it, you should know that making the widget, the product that you want to sell, is really only half the battle. And on mobile, it might be less than half the battle. You make something that crosses a threshold of goodness that people will engage with, that people will like, and then you need to spend cash money to go get users, to get user acquisition, to retain those users, to monetize those users. Yes, from a business perspective. And $100,000 isn't that unusual. But note a couple of things here, right? I said at the top of this discussion that you want to have a lawyer reviewing the terms and conditions, reviewing the agreement terms on these kinds of things. Because what you have here is Unity says it spends $100,000 a month. What does that mean? It doesn't sound like Unity spending that $100,000 a month to actually purchase ad space, to actually put things on billboards, to do things outside of the Unity family. So a lawyer would look at this and say, okay, what do we mean by spend? We need to define those terms specifically. Is that internal spend? So I'm paying for your people. Is that prorated across the time that you're spending on me and other game growth program members, across me and what you're otherwise having those people do for Unity? Am I paying for your building? Am I paying for your office space, your coffee deliveries, your lunches? What am I paying for out of that $100,000? And if I'm paying for that out of the $100,000 in my agreement, in my terms and conditions, do I have the right to audit you? Do I have the right to look at your financial books? Not for everything. I'm not trying to break into Unity, but do I have the right to go and check what exactly you're counting against me? Or do I just get a slip of paper at the end of the month that says, hey, we spent $100,000, we're taking $100,000 back. And ultimately what you did was have me pay your salary for whatever people you attributed to the game growth program. And I'm not saying Unity is going to do that. Unity might do that if they're a bad actor. Unity might not do that if they're a good actor. The job of the lawyer, the counsel, the people that you hire to look at your contracts and your terms and conditions is to look at it and say, how might the other party use this against you in a way that is basically legal? If you've ever read an article about the math magic or, or the arithmetic that a movie studio uses with a uh, licensed partner, whether that's a, a book partner or somebody else, if, if you've got back-end points, if you're an actor in, say, The Lord of the Rings, and New Line Cinema comes out and says, well, you know, that Lord of the Rings movie didn't make any money. And you say, how in the world could that be? They're massively popular. And they send you a sheet that says, well, this fee here, this fee here, this fee here, this fee here. And you have an auditor, you have a financial person, you have a lawyer, if you're going to be involved in a litigation, look at that and say, okay, well, you attributed the losses in this other movie to me. You attributed the cost of your trip to con to me. You did all these various things that shouldn't be attributed. You need to have the right to go look at those financials, or you need to have a high level of trust slash the ability to terminate the agreement, right? Because step two here is that Unity would first recoup their $100,000 in monthly user acquisition costs, leaving $30,000 in monthly revenue. So, the developer in Unity would share that $30,000 equally, giving $15,000 to the developer and $15,000 to Unity, which is a small amount of money based on $130,000 a month in revenue, right? But 
a developer could be convinced on this because 3,000 just became 15,000 and maybe they didn't have to do anything. And maybe this program only goes for a year. And then when Unity leaves, you've still got that $130,000 a month in revenue. You have to look at these projections. You have to evaluate these things. But Unity also has to evaluate these things in the same way that the developer does, right? Because if you're looking at math like this, it's great if Unity spends 100,000 and turns 3,000 into 130,000. What if Unity spends 100,000 and turns 3,000 into 10,000, right? Now you owe Unity $100,000. You only made $10,000 that month. They take all the money and the developer is now down to zero because Unity didn't spend things correctly. Unity didn't improve your situation. Unity didn't make you money. So are there protections in the contract for that? Do you somehow owe Unity that money over the course of a number of months? Do you finish the agreement owing them $600,000 because it never quite took? What does that look like? Now, they promise you that you keep your intellectual property. They promise you that, that you keep your company. So in all likelihood, that's their risk. But you would want to make sure of that in the contract. If they spend $100,000, it doesn't come back. Yeah, you don't make any money from your mobile game anymore, but they don't make any money either. And honestly, that's not what Unity wants out of this. So that's why they're evaluating this relationship. But when you enter into anything like a revenue share, like with Unity, like with anybody else, you need to have that evaluated at bare minimum for the risks that could come because maybe you look at this and you say, Rick, I don't think that's a risk. I really believe in this. I believe in Unity's people. I've met with them. They're going to do a good job. They showed me some comparables that they've done this before with. And you know what? I'm willing to take that risk. Hey, that's fine. That's all a lawyer can do for you. You say, I think this is a substantial risk. I think this is a minimal risk. If I were in your shoes, I would do this. I wouldn't. And then you have to make the choice because you're the developer. You're the business. You're going to make the money if you make the money at all. But... Bare minimum, this is a new option, right? You've heard me parade out the horribles as a lawyer does on these programs, but it's still a good thing for Unity to potentially offer to developers because for some, it's going to work. And either way, you're not forced into the program. So it's something new for Unity to offer to you. It's essentially a publishing relationship, right? Not only do we help grow your game during the partnership, but our team also works with you directly to integrate tools and best practices that will stay with you for years to come. We can't have these conversations. We can't help you get your monetization right, tell you where to place ads without you learning that, right? At a bare minimum, when you get done with this, you will have talked to the Unity folks. And if it worked out, you will have that knowledge for the future. Our goal is to de have developers outgrow the program. This doesn't make sense for you to pay Unity forever, but it might make sense to pay Unity for your first game and then use everything that you learned on your second game. And yay, now Unity is making more money through its licensing. Now you're making more money as a developer. Now there are more video games out there for consumers and everybody's happy. When the partnership ends, you maintain complete ownership of your intellectual property and game with no permanent revenue sharing commitments to Unity going forward. Here's what we mean by growing your game. We're going to help you with strategic user acquisition campaigns, whether that's advertisement, how to get people coming back day after day. We're going to analyze your game economy. We're going to work with you to implement optimizations, right? Which is language that I know a number of you probably don't like. Optimizations there is how can we get that 99 cent microtransaction through? How, maybe that should be $1.99. How can we get a little bit more money on the margins from the people that are already engaging with your game? So yeah, if you're not on the business side, if you're on the consumer side, you don't love that. But from the business side, it's a good thing. And overall, we want more game developers out there making games. I, I do understand why you would look at this language and be like, ooh, ooh, I understand. Game growth experts work with your development team to manage and optimize ad placements and in-app purchases. And we work with you to implement tools and tactics to increase player engagement. Your slot machine should maybe have a few more bells and whistles on it. Once the package is installed, you install this Unity Editor game growth package. It gives them analytics that they can use to evaluate whether your game's a good fit. We will consider key metrics that help indicate a game's success, specifically D1 retention and D7 retention. That's people that return on day one after day zero and day seven after day zero. Average session duration, average sessions per user, install conversion rates, and cost per install. How likely are you to succeed? <clears throat> and do you have a game that is right on the verge of going through and being super popular? Because if you do, we can put the money behind it. We can see all of the pieces in place for a recipe that's really going to work on the platform. And so we can use that to your benefit and to ours. And how do you apply? All you need is a Unity ID and a game made with Unity Live on iOS or Android. 
If you use Unity, this could be something that works for you. It is an early access. They're going to take a very limited number of people right now on this particular item. But if this becomes popular, if this really works out for Unity, then you could expect this publishing to be one of those benefits, one of those big bullet points that they put up there that says, hey, we help people do this. And, and Unreal does some of these kinds of things already. Uh, Epic does some of the kind of the, these kinds of things already, and they will continue to do so. But competition on these kinds of things is good. And Unity looks at this and says, yeah, you know, Epic having issues. Unreal Engine is going to be that kind of thing that developers are going to look at maybe slightly more askance. Maybe not everybody, but at least on the margins. And so Unity is taking advantage of that with announcements like this one. Wouldn't surprise me if there were more announcements in the future, perhaps limited discounts, whatever it might be to go and attack that market share of Unreal if Unity properly, I think, senses a certain amount of weakness there. Now, if you've got your own comments on this, please leave them to this video. Please tell me where you are seeing other big companies potentially moving in response to what we are seeing either from Congress or from Epic or from the other members of the Coalition for App Fairness, how everybody is kind of reacting to each other on the software front. Whether you see Sony do anything with all of these threats now to the walled garden model itself, which I would suspect we'd only see as it gets closer to some kind of litigation finale, whether in the form of settlement or court of appeals ruling or something along those lines. But if you see those, tell me about them. I love to talk about these kinds of things, as you can probably tell here in virtual legality. And I would love to talk about these things with you all and to talk about how these companies react to a pending litigation way, way, way before any final determination could be made on that score. This has been Virtual Legality for today. If you enjoyed this, please like, subscribe, share, tell people that we're here. It is so, so important. It makes this channel grow even better, has better conversations, and, and we get out to more people with hopefully more and better information on the business and law of video games, music, movie, television, pop culture, all the things you are already interested in and reading about and hopefully adding a little bit more information and educational material on those topics to your life. If you caught this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it as a podcast, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.